In Earth's history, pterosaurs were flying reptiles which dominated the skies during the Age of Dinosaurs. Although some did have feathers, or at least filaments so similar it seems pretentious to call them anything else, the wings of pterosaurs were made of membranes supported by a single massive finger and stretched to the leg. Unlike birds, which take off with their legs but fly with their wings, it seems pterosaurs took off from a quadrupedal stance and mostly launched with their wings. This consolidation of anatomy seems to have been more efficient than bird takeoff, and is often cited as to why the largest pterosaurs were able to get so much bigger than the largest birds. They were highly diverse and successful, with towering giants, diminutive critters, filter feeders, and specialists in fish, insects, and small game. Although they went extinct alongside the dinosaurs 66 million years ago on Earth, their legacy continued on Chimer through the planet's own great extinction, and continues to define the skies to this day, with greater diversity than ever before. Chimer is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. The most common pterosaurs, and indeed most frequently encountered by Chimerans, are the Aneuronathids. These tiny pterosaurs occupy the niche insect-specialized birds and bats do on Earth, with both diurnal and nocturnal taxa. Although the introduction of the two clades mentioned above, first in the Oligocene and more prominently in the Miocene, impacted in urinated numbers and biodiversity, these pterosaurs have held on in a wide range of modern niches in the known world and beyond. Largest is the Morakai, or Batwing Owl, of Picardia. They are a crepuscular species, active both day and night. As Picardia does not have many flying insects, largely due to the colder climate but also regular rains, the Morakai are much more of a generalist species than their northern cousins, often supplementing their diet with small birds, rodents, and multituberculates. Like firebirds, their feathers have hydrophobic oils that allow them to stay warm and dry while they hunt. They are highly successful, being found throughout Picardia and the Southern Islands. While they do compete with Karakai firebirds, small raptors, and cats for small rodents and a few bat species for insects, their generalist approach to hunting has been quite successful. There are over a dozen species in the mainland genera. These insect specialists tend to do better than bats in Chimere's forests. Although echolocation can be highly beneficial in very dense forests, where bats tend to thrive, in the more open habitats such as Titan Gardens, which make up the vast majority of Chimere's forests, keen vision appears to offer enough depth perception advantage that aneuronaphids are more common there. It may be also as simple as aneuronaphids were in the niche first and bats failed to fully outcompete them, rather than being a rather than being an inherently inferior method. Recent naturalists suggest that disparity may come down to wing structure, not hunting senses. And your naphids have wings supported by a single finger, whereas bat wings have three primary supports. This means that bats ha can more efficiently have wings that are short and broad, but are maneuvering through a cluttered habitat. While well, your naphids tend to have larger wings, while aneurinated wings tend to have trouble past a certain size in being short and broad, they are better suited for faster and longer flights in open spaces, and their agility tends to be comparable. They generally are better not only at chasing down insects, but also outpacing or evading predators. Whatever the reason, be it sensory, wing structure, or luck, in happening to have these adaptation firsts, closed forests tend to be dominated by bats, while aneurinathids dominate open forests. On the prairie, both clades and birds have their specialists. The fastest mammal in Chimere is the golden bat, an insect specialist from the Housie Prairie. They spend their days in forests or abandoned termite mounds, but come nightfall, they take to the sky and chase their prey at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. There are many aneuronathids on the prairie as well. Some larger species also rest in the forest and mounds, with some more diurnal and some nocturnal species. 
The burrows of sloths, aardvarks, and hyenas also serve as roosts. The smallest pterosaur in Chimere, the cricket snipe, is an anure naphid that rests in housey grass during the day and hunts at night. As they live amongst their prey, they don't need to be as large to efficiently travel from a roost, and because of this, the cricket owl is around the size of a thumb with a wingspan of 4 inches. They are quite successful, and they live in massive colonies. Animals disturbing them in their rest during the day can be shocked by thousands of tiny pterosaurs taking to the skies. Although some find aneuronathids unnerving, either for their resemblance to insects or to bats, chimerians are far more tolerant and accepting of aneuronathids than bats because they carry far fewer diseases transmissible to chimerians, and their efficiency at culling insect pests is legendary. As our selection specialists that nest wherever there is ample food, their populations rapidly increase and concentrate where there is potential food and shelter. Farmers will often make houses for them, marking them in fox urine or chicken feces. Bats tend to be wary of these scents, whereas in your naphids, which have poor senses of smell, seem to ignore them and therefore colonize the houses more quickly. With a house of pterosaurs to help keep pests off their crops, Chimerian farmers have long associated these little pterosaurs with good fortune and promising harvest. Sailors also regard aneuronathids highly, especially the sapphire snipe, a tiny iridescent aneuronathid. Spiders often take to water and colonize ships to feed and breed, and there are some times of year hundreds of spiders can fill out a craft in a matter of days. Sapphire snipes will not only compete with spiders for insects out on the open water, they will also land on the ship and clear out the spiders too. Enough sailors have taken a painful spider bite to appreciate the services offered by these little critters. Jade snipes, a related species, serve the same function in swamps and are especially common in the seretic wetlands, and the emerald snipe of Picardia and the southern islands. These batwing snipes are universally revealed by seafaring chimerians, and those who trade in their radiant feathers are cursed and even prosecuted in some regions. For all the luck, reverence, and appreciation most inurnathids are shown, the same cannot be said of the titan storks, their giant and distant cousins. Although much of their diversity was lost in the aftermath of the dynastic extinction, some Ishdarkids held on as small game generalists hunting rodents on the ground, and this branch has come back with a vengeance. Their ancestor of all modern species is descended from an animal much like a rat packer, a small Ishdarkid found throughout the known world, although more common in dry tropical habitats. They have forsaken their middle three fingers for a hoof-like cluster of scales, which helps protect their forelimbs from damage as they gallop about chasing small game. Their preference is rodents, but they will take about just any small game they can fit into their mouths, even taking on more than they can swallow in their voracity. Although filthy in appearance, many cities begrudgingly appreciate and accept having them around, as they happily eat refuse and clean up any pests they find, both rodent and insect. They don't have a foul smell, likely due to having a poor sense of smell themselves, but they emit shrill cries whenever they find potential food, or at least enough to support others. They are social animals, living in decentralized flocks, and are surprisingly altruistic in making sure others are fed. They are constantly on the move, searching for more prey, and most cities have become accustomed to them and begrudgingly accept their presence as a frustrating assistant in keeping their streets clean. Some even welcome them into houses, especially if rodents are spotted. Less accepted is their massive cousin, the Titan Stork, or Corpse Packer. This as Darkid reigns between 8 and 10 feet tall and behaves much like their little cousins. Unfortunately, their idea of small game includes little children and pets, so they are far less welcome. However, some pests are larger than a rat pecker can handle, and they do provide invaluable services in processing larger pests than carrion. In fact, their proclivity as scavengers and willingness to cooperate and form bonds has made them popular companions of undertakers and coroners. They certainly don't aid in the reputation, 
nor does the fact that white and black morphs are common in regions where they don't need to worry about predators, but these angels of death do provide invaluable, if unsavory, services to Chimeran settlements. In the wild, Titan storks prefer open habitat, although the Titan gardens forests are generally acceptable. They are swift creatures able to gallop at 30 miles per hour over short distances. That said, they are fully proficient flyers, and it just takes some time for them to get airborne. So they usually take off to get between hunting territory or in search of a mate or nesting site. Flying is also a good way to evade predation, as only one flying predator is large enough to bring them down, and we will cover that next week. Their wings are studded with spurs, mostly used to help with competition of others of their kind, but can also deter predators or fellow scavengers in claiming a carcass. Clutches usually happen in batches of a dozen, with smaller species laying more, and females will lay many more clutches and larger if there is enough food in the area to support it. She will often spread out the clutches in several areas, with some in a tree, others buried, but most in an open nest that she will guard. Young Ishdarkids are born ready to hunt and fly, and their mothers offer no support once they hatch. Juveniles often stick together, and this is the foundation of their core flock. For this reason, and how frequently and unpredictable females can nest, it can be very difficult to keep populations in check. Although generally a tropical clade, the main stork of Picardia and southern islands provides similar services to these habitats of the temperate regions. These animals tend to live in much smaller groups and often hunt alone. They are far less comfortable around humans, but will linger near settlements to snatch a free meal. Tallest and most imposing of all flying animals, the Sunrise Titan is a truly massive Ashdarkid, rivaling the sizes of the great titans of the Tyrant Dynasty. Looming at around 20 feet tall, even higher with the horns of males, they are a frightening presence on the prairie. Although their smaller cousins evolved in the known world, the Sunrise Titan flew to Kyrule and got massive, coming back west with the spread of the housey grass. This habitat is perfect for this outsized giant. With a galloping speed of over 35 miles per hour, they can run down all manner of small game. Given their great size, small game includes prey less than 300 pounds, and chimerans are on the menu. Their eyes are set wide on their head, meaning that they can scan for and keep a lock on prey while running at great speed and even while flying. Their vision is quite keen. While limits are not known, they are recorded to spot prey from 3 miles above, and circling vultures over a carcass at least 40 miles off. As they lack a refined sense of smell, vision while flying is often how they spot potential meals. They don't usually kill on the wing, preferring to chase down game once they found it on land, but they often like hunting near maces where they can bring back kills after taking it down. Given their great size and the fact that they can carry as much as 300 pounds and still fly without much encumbrance, it is no surprise that many have tried to tame them as viable mounts. Unlike the Titan Stork and Rat Peckers, which are quite comfortable around humans, the Sunrise Titan will simply view them as prey. They do not care for their young, so there is no imprinting instinct to use, and unlike their smaller cousins, they are not social animals. Even so, many attempts have been made, and the Shu tell of witches who had these towering monsters as their familiars, though thus far, no reports of using Sunrise Titans' mounts have been verified. As if their size were not enough to make them an imposing sight, the undersides of Sunrise Titan wings have a radiant iridescence with a range of warm colors giving them their name. While the back of their wing membrane is dark to protect the skin from sunburn, the interior is often dazzling to onlookers. It is assumed this beautiful display is meant for intimidation while claiming a kill, something quite easy to do with a 40-foot wingspan, and there are likely colors within this display that we can't even see, but work quite well against cockatrices and terror birds they compete with, which have a far wider field of color vision. 
although it was long assumed that nyctosaurs went extinct, having disappeared to the dynastic extinction, an obscure marine pterosaur from the northern waters of the Inland Sea have shown to be a relic of this clade. They are flightless ambush hunters, spending most of their days in reefs and rocky shallows. Called Burin by the Kenturim Islanders, these penguin-like pterosaurs are said to be from north of the equator and not trapped in the inland sea by the heat of the equatorial currents. Accounts from explorers from the north include tales of all sorts of unknown beasts, and it is generally accepted that they may well be more nyctosaurs in that region, perhaps even volant species in the temperate areas. Next week, we will explore the more diverse clade of chimeran pterosaurs, the Tapajarids. The leveling of the ecological playing fields after the dynastic extinction worked very much in their favor. This includes aerial and terrestrial hunters, fish specialists, beach combers, nut and seed specialists, apex predators, and even flightless pterosaurs which converge upon the body plan and lifestyle of apes. Thank you to Gage Weber for sponsoring this episode. It has been a real treat finally getting to focus on these fascinating and important members of Chimere's cast. Cheers to my Patreon patrons for your support. Helping me out even at the lowest tier is instrumental in helping me focus on Chimere as a full-time project. Also, thank you for watching this all the way through. Ad revenue has become an increasingly important source of revenue and support, and watching these videos helps a lot more than you might think, and it means so much to me that you do so. Thanks all around, and I'll see you next week for the final installment of this series. Cheers, folks!